Good morning. I'd like to invite Dr. Murli Shastri here to take on the next, the first panel discussion for the TCTD Symposium 2018. Dr. Murli Shastri is the CEO of the IITB Monash Research Academy that aims at enhancing research collaborations between Australia and India. He is one of India's leading nanotechnologists between Australia and with close to 25 years of research experience in the field of materials chemistry with a focus on nanotechnology. There is much more that can be said about him, but I'd like to add that he's also a fellow of the Indian Academy of Sciences. Dr. Shastri is one of our core faculty team members, bringing out Tata Center's CEP course on end-to-end -end innovation. Thank you, Dr. Shastri. Thank you, Gayatri, and uh, thank you to the Tata Center for uh, inviting me to uh, moderate this session. Um, the topic is uh, technological innovation for uh, social impact, challenges and differences in perspective, quite a mouthful. Uh, and the topic is also quite complex. So um, we have assembled a very eminent panel to discuss this topic. But what I'll try to do is basically set the tone, maybe some ground rules and um, some leading questions to, to initiate the discussion. It's actually a nice segue to Professor Joshi's talk. And I think he's covered many critical elements of the value chain that we are also going to be discussing. So thank you very much. Um, very interesting talk. Uh, it's a hot topic. I mean, there are no two opinions about the fact that social innovation or innovation of social relevance is um, extremely topical and uh, of great relevance. As a person who's been in the innovation field for uh, quite some time now, uh, I've seen the evolution of the concept of innovation right from the fact, from the point at which R&D overnight became innovation. It became a buzzword. And most of the innovation initially was centered around technological innovation for the, for the top of the pyramid, where Price points weren't too much of an issue, but that's where you start, right? And then slowly, I think there's a realization that innovation can play a much bigger role uh, for the, for the so-called bottom of the pyramid. That's where we are now, and therefore you have significant government interventions ac actually coming in, and uh, a lot of very interesting developments that are happening around technology for, for social impact. But let me just dissect the title a little bit, the title of this particular discussion. Uh, and um, kind of define what innovation was defined as some time ago and what it's perceived to be right now. Well, innovation, if you just want to distill it down to a simple equation, it's defined as invention plus exploitation. Now, the word exploitation has a negative connotation, so I'll just uh, replace exploitation with value creation. The moment you do that, uh, it opens up uh, a universe of possibilities. It's not just about commercial value. You can also talk about social value. But it's a very difficult concept to, to address. What is social value? Where are we actually playing? The bottom of the pyramid is one way, one way that we can play. In my own personal experience, um, and it actually began quite by good fortune, uh, in 2007, late 2007, when we had uh, Professor C.K. Prahalad, who had visited the Innovation Center in Tata Chemicals. Uh, at that point of time, I was the chief scientist at Tata Chemicals. And we were grappling with uh, deciding what kind of strategy the Innovation Center would, would adopt. Uh, we were defining the contours of the sandbox, and that's the methodology that he would use. And he made a couple of very interesting statements, I think, which we took to heart, and it resulted in a, in a lot of new learnings that came our way. He said one of the contours, that you, one of the boundaries of the sandbox that you can look at is uh, social relevance. Why don't you technologists, I mean, we had a bunch of people, uh, ranging in skills from biotech to nanotech to material science, said, why don't you focus on the bottom of the pyramid? And that became, in some sense, a mantra that we started following in the, in the Innovation Center. And uh, it basically threw us headlong into a number of different activities. One of the outcomes was Tata Swatch. And I'm not going to get into the details there. But the learnings were quite insightful. And I'm just going to enumerate some of the things that we came across. These are very well-known concepts, and, and I do hope that the panelists are going to be addressing each one of these issues. Uh, bottom of the pyramid product products, in fact, 
Um, I think Professor Ravi Sinha mentioned this, uh, when the whole concept behind the data center. How can we make technologies available to the people that need it the most? And often these people, the base of the pyramid, are incapable of actually paying the cost of that technology. There's a huge challenge there. So one of the things that we said we should do is, can we make profitable, high-end technologies available to the base of the pyramid? Then, of course, again, Professor Joshi alluded to this, you really need to know what the technology has to do in the market. The touch and feel of the product. How is it going to be used? What are the constraints that one would encounter in deploying these technologies? So identifying and the definition of constraints is a very critical element, huge learnings that, that, we, uh, that we could uh, get into. Affordable, cutting edge technological innovations, is that an oxymoron? In some sense it is, right? If you look at the way technologies have been deployed, high end technologies always are intended, have been intended for the people who could pay for it. But can we look at affordable, cutting edge technological innovations for the base of pyramid? And then finally, and this is an open ended question, there are no magic bullets. Does social innova innovation equate to a non profit kind of a situation? And again, Professor Joshi gave beautiful examples of how one might actually break that kind of a barrier. And finally, what sort of an ecosystem do you need to create? It's one thing to ideate. It's another thing to scale up, but it's yet another thing to actually take it to market. How do you actually create that kind of an ecosystem? And our panelists sp span the entire spectrum of the value chain. We have um, assembled academics who are ideators and people who can actually come up with excellent proof of concept. We have entrepreneurs who will be speaking. We also have people who have been involved in policy making. But how do you get all of them together to actually come up with viable technologies and solutions for, for social change? Well, with that, very brief uh, introduction. I will start introducing our panelists and, and request them to come out to the stage. Uh, we are a little time constrained, constraints as always, and I would request uh, our panelists to reduce their presentation by a couple of minutes. So instead of 10, if you can make it seven, three minutes, that'll be great. So our first panelist is Dr. Rob Stoner. Dr. Rob Stoner is Deputy Director of the MIT Energy Initiative and he's the director of the Tata Center for Technology and Design at MIT. His current research interests include energy technology and policy for developing countries, as well as design for resource-constrained resource settings. He's also served as a, as a study group member uh, of Future of Solar Energy Studies. Um, he is a PhD in uh, condensed matter physics from Brown University. Uh, he's served on many different uh, task forces uh, the most recent one being the Clinton Foundation, which brought him to Africa and India for significant periods of time. So, Rob, if you can uh, give us your presentation, please. Well, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to speak here. It's nice to be at the first symposium uh, at, at IIT. We are now going on to our fourth next year at MIT, uh, and uh, we're really enjoying working along now in parallel with you at IIT in, in uh, so many ways. I think everything I'm going to say is in, se in some sense a footnote to what Professor Joshi has just told us. Um, and I appreciate your remarks very much. Uh, and, and what I liked most about what he said was that we're talking about big scale here. He's thinking big. Um, and and this, this brings me to the, the challenge that we deal with uh, in, in the Tata Center at MIT of trying to bring technological sophistication to bear in improving the lives of people who are considered to not be able to afford it. Uh, a rational business person looks at the sorts of opportunities that we take on and says, well, yes, I know how to solve that problem. I, I, I have the technology. It's readily at hand. But if I put in the effort and the financial resources to actually solve it, all I've got at the end of the day is this market full of poor people that can't afford it. Maybe I can rely on the government or ask the government to subsidize it in some way, but the government can't subsidize everything. So I think I'll look at other markets. We have the advantage and, and golden opportunity, I'd say, thanks to the Tata Trusts, and I can't see anyone from the Tata Trusts here, but I'm sure you're out there. Thank you, wherever you may be, to step back from the situation and reach deep into our institutions to find 
innovative people who are willing to make a special effort to rethink solutions and not just cost down, but find other ways to approach the solutions that, that can be brought to bear in these situations. Um, so let me, let me talk a little bit about the, the experience that I had that informs my way of thinking of things at the Tata Center and, and exposes, I think, some of the challenges that we face in being successful. I took several years off about a decade ago to work with the Clinton Foundation. The Clinton Foundation was doing something very interesting at the time that's been copied to a certain extent by other people, but at that time was, was very exciting to me. They were looking at the HIV AIDS epidemic around the world, particularly in the developing world, and particularly in Africa and Southeast Asia, and examining the existing solution, which was to supply ARV drugs using funds that were raised through charity or by going to the companies that manufactured these drugs and asking them to make contributions of small quantities of them so that they could be distributed to the poor people in, in, in the affected countries. And they had to do that because those drugs were too expensive for those people to be able to afford. This was a charity game. Bill Clinton had a number of people working with him, all business consultants, who decided that there was a better way to go about this. And their idea was to think of this as a market problem. And they looked at the 47 countries that had very high levels of HIV and said, look, we can do something differently here. We can bring these countries together collectively into a buying consortium. And collectively, they represent a very large prospective uh, purchaser of, of, of HIV AIDS drugs. And we can take that consortium's demand and go to a company that is willing to manufacture these drugs using off, off uh, uh, patents and present them with the opportunity to build manufacturing capacity sufficient to be able to meet demand in those countries. And further, we can work with them as business consultants to take cost out of their supply chains all the way back to the, uh, the, the very front end where the feedstocks that they require are, are made. And then we can hire a bunch of young people for not very much money and have them work very closely with the governments of the affected countries to build up a order, uh, a monthly order, a forecast based on what they think they're going to need. And collectively, we'll be able to put together an order that will fully load a large factory uh, in, in a low-cost producing country, say India. And they went to CIPLA here and convinced CIPLA to build a large factory, and they did that. And together, over the course of three years, a very short period of time, far less than the time required to develop a new drug, for example, they were able to bring the cost of ARVs down by 90% and make it possible for the affected countries to now be able to buy them with cash that they had. So that's a very different way of looking at a problem, and it exposes, uh, I, think, I think, things that we have to think about. One is, certainly there's a, there's a technological component to this. The ARVs required a huge amount of learning and R&D activity uh, to, to, to be able to make them and make them effective. That was, that was there. The second thing was that it, it required business acumen and sophistication, almost as much sophistication as required, required by the scientists who made the drugs to be able to think through this systems problem or business problem. And third, it took alignment with governments, government operations, government ambition, the government mission to provide these sorts of socially necessary things at very large scale. That way of thinking of technical innovation as part of a systems problem is what informs our method at the Tata Center. Uh, and, and it informs what we ask of our students and teach our students. We have a pro seminar, which uh, you also have here at IIT, in which you, you, you teach some of the skills as best we can uh, to the students of business. Uh, we teach them to think about these business problems as, as part of a big system problem. We teach them to think about how to work with government. We ask our students to meet with three types of uh, uh, 
collaborators when they come to India, collaborators who are perhaps representative of, of the problem we're trying to solve, community members and NGOs, members of business who are uh, able to, to advise us on, on how the things that we're developing might be made and delivered to these people, but always government as the third constituency. Um, not because we're going to government and asking for subsidies to be given, that's impractical, but, but rather to align ourselves with government programs or perhaps in some cases to encourage government to put in place new programs that can be helpful in bringing the things we're making to scale. Um, and by bringing together this pro seminar and the activities of our students in India in those three dimensions, we're beginning to make progress. Um, we've, we've now reached a stage after five and a half years where many of our innovations are in fact coming to scale and it's really gratifying to see this beginning to happen, um, taking advantage of, of systems thinking. So one, one new thing I can tell you that, that we're also learning is that although our students are very smart like yours, uh, very, very capable technologically and very ambitious and hardworking, they are at an early stage in their career and, and in most cases lack the experience of thinking of problems in the system's way, uh, particularly where they involve a business dimension. And so we have created a new uh, late stage program uh, led by Jason Prappas, who's sitting somewhere over here, there he is, um, called a translational research program in which we are bringing to bear more business experience, uh, much in the way I described with the, the Tata Center, to try to bring together um, the, the, the many necessary pieces that must be there to, to bring our products forward. Uh, and I look forward to, to sharing uh, our experience as we gain it over the course of the next year. But I, I should say that I, I'm very um, excited about the progress that's being made and uh, the, the thinking that we had originally about bringing these things out uh, at scale is actually achievable. So I'll leave it there um, and, and take my seat. Dr. Sasky. So thank you, Rob. Uh, uh, we'll move on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is Professor B. Ravi. Um, brief introduction, Professor B. Ravi is the, an institute chair professor of mechanical engineering at IIT Bombay, where he heads the eFoundry and BETIC, which is the Biomedical Engineering and Technology Incubation Center on campus. Uh, he's associated with a number of entities, similar entities across, across the country. He's um, guided 14 PhDs and produced 75 master's students. Um, and his focus has been related to uh, introducing new novel technologies related to CAD, simulation, and 3D printing for metal casting and medical device sectors. Um, he has initiated several interdisciplinary programs across the country focused on translational research. Uh, the most important one, of course, is his philosophy of the golden spiral for collaborative innovation by connecting education, research, development, and application. And this is reflected in uh, the establishment of 12 e-foundries and six similar betic cells across the country. So really delighted to have Ravi here. Uh, Ravi, please come forward. But I thank all the organizers who have called me here, and I still hope to be able to say something which is quick and uh, something which you can take away with you today. So I uh, head a center called the Biomedical Engineering and Technology Incubation Center. And I'll kind of speak about our experience and some takeaways, hopefully, on how we're taking some ideas to, to actual social impact by bringing these people together. We want to bring researchers, engineers, and entrepreneurs together. Uh, so uh, I'm going to focus on healthcare, although it's my second domain area, and it, is, it has more social impact. They're the kind of devices which we need in the country at this point of time. And uh, you can see also that the healthcare spending in India is about 1% of, of USA, and even much lower than a world average. So our challenges are quite different, and the way we tackle them also have to be different in that sense. If you look at our requirement, our industry, it is kind of almost non-existent. I mean, there are hardly 300 companies which are licensed by government. Many of them are out, going out of business now because they're not able to see the new regulatory regime. And most of them are very small companies. They, don't, they hardly matter. So we really have to look at creating a new generation of entrepreneurs who can handle the, the med tech sector or, or the medical device sector. The issue is that our industry is too nascent. They're getting hit from both from the west in terms of the branding and from the east in terms of 
they can say the low cost and the doctors always asking for more and more uh, new features or a higher reliability or of course at the cost lower cost uh, all the time so it looks like a hopeless situation honestly <laughs> but uh, we thought that here is a, a, a silver lining in the cloud in the sense that a lot of new things which are on the horizon like 3d printing and imaging and of course sensors they are giving an opportunity for our youngsters to rethink those devices and perhaps reinvent them. So innovation is the only way forward is one conclusion from this slide. But that cannot happen until you put all these people together. You need people from bio and materials and engineering and manufacturing and of course electrical and electronics together to work together. You need people who can integrate all these things together. So what we uh, worried about and what we realized very early in the game is it's very easy to create, take an idea from the domain and and build a prototype. That's what we do academics. And we file a patent or publication, and we think our job is over. Then we realize there's no point unless we take it to a product stage. And product stage is something which actually works, which it, it will not uh, no, break down if, if it falls down and so on. And then that's still the part of the game is to take it further into market, you know, product to market. And we realize these are the valleys of death that academic or innovator faces. And it's, it's doable, the first one. I, I put some tentative numbers here the amount of money and how much amount of time it takes. But these are true values of death. So the main values, of course, the problem is how to create a product or a, or a batch of products for which we don't have enough of uh, facilities. The other thing I realize is that the way we look at the whole problem. We academics look at a problem from our end of the spectrum, which is mostly about research, whereas industry or engineer looks at differently, and entrepreneur looks at totally differently altogether. So we see that researchers worry more about the equipment and experiments and results and publications. Whereas the engineers will say, look at the middle part, which is about you know, how do you get the design right, how do you get the materials right, or tolerances right, and so on. And the entrepreneur looks at the business end of the thing, creating a factory or distribution network and supply chain, and so on. So in this whole scenario, now I present to you a, a quick glimpse of, in a couple of minutes, what we could do. Uh, this shed is about 100 meters from this uh, place. It's about, uh, um, we kind of recreated a small lab. It's hardly about 1,500 to 2,000 square feet. And uh, the way I solve the problem is by getting a bunch of people together. About one third are actually people who are given up good jobs, l and Intel, uh, Wipro, and so on. And they come in all kinds of colors. If you can just about make out, you can see greens who are bio, and uh, oranges who are mechanical manufacturing, and the blues who are electrical, electronics, and computer science, and so on. And these people together are now kind of changing the whole game by spending a lot of time in the field first. So we don't take a problem unless we know exactly what we want to solve. Up to three to four months we take to just come with a one-line definition of what we need to solve. And then we go into the development phase, and then the testing phase, and finally the industry, which is IPR and business plan and so on. One lesson here, maybe take away for you is, we listed 400 plus unmet clinical needs from about 200, hospital, 200 doctors from about 25 hospitals. And we selected about 100 of them. How we selected the criteria, and I won't go into details of that, but we have now some very nice rules of how to pick up good problems which have higher potential of going forward. And from that, we picked about uh, 30 uh, innovators from those hackathons which we conduct, 35 innovators. All of them have filed patents, 35 patents filed in the last two, two and a half years. And out of that, we have about 15 products almost reached or reaching into the end business or end use. Uh, so here are the pictures of some of the devices. Uh, we have about five, six surgical tools, only one software. Everything is hardware. Uh, we have uh, uh, five, six of uh, diagnostic devices and a few of uh, rehabilitation devices. We are reinventing the Jaipur leg by making it more patient specific, putting a knee joint, and so on and so forth. You see also see the name in brackets of the startups or, or the companies who have licensed these products. And all this in two and a half years, as I mentioned to you. Uh, it's not just we have come to this stage. The impact part, I think, what was important in, in this session. So here are actually the 15 surgeries, heart surgeries done using our instrument. Um, so many patients who are, who are getting detected by COPD and, and, and other problems. Uh, club food babies who, to, to whom we are given a brace monitor by which it can be have better, better uh, solution. About 65 patients detected for glaucoma. And these devices are typically about one-fifth to one-tenth the cost of an equivalent device in the market and equally effective if, or if for a different purpose, let's say for screening, very effective. You could have seen the, the Jaipur leg the patient who is walking around, even on uneven terrain and so on. So this is my last slide. Uh, what is my learning and what is my lesson here is that 
the, the biggest pain point was that our engineers who have left their jobs to work and dream, they are spending 40 to 50 percent of time chasing different vendors, going to maybe laser welding or maybe CNC machining or maybe uh, 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 electronic chip manufacturing. I thought if you can even put those somehow in, in one, one place where, a, where an innovator or a scientist can go with a basic proof of concept and uh, hand it over to an industrial designer who can make it beautiful, make it more ergonomic, and of course uh, a certified GMP is good manufacturing practice in medical domain, medical manufacturing, pilot production, make 10 pieces, 20 pieces suitable for maybe testing or test marketing and so on, and of course uh, some kind of a mentoring and things like that. This we could, if we have something like that, we could not only bring in various groups of people within the institution like that, but also outside. There are many doctors who in their class 12 could not decide whether to do engineering or medicine, and they have gone to medicine, and they come in, want to kind of live their engineering life with us, in a sense. So if you can give a chance to people like that, I am sure we can have a lot more impact in terms of, as you mentioned, um, startups and, uh, of course, uh, employment and of course thought leaders and of course overall social impact. So I'll stop here. I thought we have some points which you can pick up and discuss further if you have time. Thank you so much. B. Professor Santosh Narona. Um, professor Santosh Narona is a professor of uh, chemical engineering here at, at IIT uh, Bombay. Uh, he's a biochemical engineer by training, but he's now um, a truly multidisciplinary uh, scientist working across many, many different areas. Uh, his current focus is on understanding various metabolic and regulatory aspects of microbial systems, rationally manipulating their productivity for production of therapeutics, etc. Um, he has been involved in the creation of a number of uh, centers on campus. Uh, he coordinates the development and deployment of virtual labs, which is uh, an MHRD ICT project. He's also a coordinator for the Healthcare Research Consortium at IIT Bombay, which interfaces with major hospitals and research labs in the Mumbai area. He's also an entrepreneur, well on his way to becoming a successful entrepreneur, I understand. So it's a pleasure to have you uh, with us, uh, Santosh. Yeah. I don't know about the successful part, but we'll see. Um, I'll actually take off from where Ravi's just uh, ended, which is uh, try to describe what's in it for an IIT faculty member to get into the space and try to describe the various issues that we've had to uh, encounter and tackle uh, along the way. As you pointed out, um, uh, we got into this uh, space of talking to clinicians about four or five years ago uh, in the creation of, through this process of creation of various centers, and we've been bombarded with all kinds of requests for solutions. Uh, and in some ways, that's been a good thing because it's forced us to immediately ask the question as to which one, which one, which problems do we actually spend a time on? It's, it's a good headache to have in its own way. Uh, and this is what actually takes you down this uh, path of asking whether there is high value to certain problems which in, uh, in both in a commercial sense but also in terms of societal impact. There's a flip side to that, which is that um, as a, a non-profit institute, a research uh, and education institute, you're not necessarily uh, going to have the luxury of saying that you'll only make create solutions for profit. Okay? The demand here is for a societal solution. In many cases, some of the solutions that are being asked for will not have profit which sets us up with this unique question as to what's the business proposition here down the road for us to engage in such solutions. And we're already starting to look at certain things having to be, for example, products which we create, which definitely have a clinical impact, but which will, for example, have to be cross-subsidized by other products which are way more profitable. Okay? And um, for this, of course, your typical angel investors down the road are irrelevant. You're going to need people tuned to your thought process of how you're going to actually engage, take things out to market. Now, um, given that in particular the healthcare system on, uh, in our country is focused on tertiary care, uh, it's meant that uh, if you're going to innovate, uh, there are actually opportunities elsewhere in the whole ecosystem of healthcare. For example, uh, pushing services away from tertiary facilities into the interior, trying to create business models which uh, allow for manufacture, deployment, maintenance, and while you're at it, creating jobs by skilling paramedics who will actually deploy services in the interior. Um, unfortunately, that implies that for the engineer here, if you're going to create a solution and try to place it somewhere, you've got to now engage in skilling people. And it's not a, a simple uh, aspect of just uh, creating a prototype and then expecting that to magically be deployed uh, uh, out there. 
Uh, we, of course, skill engineers, but skilling paramedics, skilling uh, and certifying paramedics, which is not something an IIT would normally do, is something we've had to engage in. And uh, in its own way, this model flips now, because you talk about training people to deploy solutions, but in that process, you create markets for products which otherwise would never exist. And we're looking at unique scenarios unfold in the country as we go along. Uh, there is a window of opportunity, especially in healthcare. We're looking at uh, a 30-year time frame wherein the entire paradigm for healthcare ought to change in the country. Uh, it's, as I pointed out, something which is focused on emergency care in tertiary facilities. That's our first point of contact when you have a problem with a clinician. And it's got to flip into a screening and uh, awareness kind of mode where, uh, to be honest, uh, the central government has its hands full in terms of outreach and um, focus and therefore it's expecting other stakeholders to step up and create paradigms and deploy these. Uh, it sounds like a daunting challenge, but conversely there's a huge opportunity both in terms of entrepreneurship, but also in terms of uh, technology development. And some of these are probably points that we can uh, focus on a little later during the discussion. So thank you. Thanks, Santosh. You uh, got us some uh, decent time also. Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Manoj Kumar. Uh, Manoj is a senior advisor to the Tata Trust, where in addition to his advisory role, he also owns the executive responsibility for all university and institutional collaborations. Uh, he has conceived and co-founded the Foundation for Innovation and Social Entrepreneurship to nurture social innovators through their lab to market journey. Uh, he is also the architect and chief evangelist of Social Alpha, an ecosystem stack that aims to provide full life cycle idea to impact support to social innovators and entrepreneurs. He's based out of uh, Bangalore. Before his association with the Tata Trust, Manoj co-founded Malgaria, I hope I got it right, a boutique consulting firm that helps companies identify and address their most, most critical challenges and turn around business performance. Uh, he is a very successful entrepreneur and he's also an angel seed investor, so he has pretty much uh, been involved in all elements of the value chain. Uh, we're really delighted to have you with us, Manoj, and uh, look forward to your presentation. Good morning, and thank you for inviting me. Professor Joshi, thanks for a very enlightening lecture this morning. Uh, you said today what remains unsaid and unpublished most of the time, and the core critical challenges of social innovation and why it's important to take innovation to communities for which they were originally meant to be and the ROI of research. So thank you so much for highlighting that point. Uh, I will rest, uh, restrict my, uh, my narrative uh, to innovation and entrepreneurship today uh, and, and just try to highlight based on our experience in Tata Trust uh, the asymmetry and uniqueness uh, that uh, that you face in social sector and any model that that is based on copy paste from commercial world is bound to fail because it doesn't recognize the structural uh, and various other issues that exist in social sector people are poor because there are certain regions so when you are innovating for underserved, poor, or marginalized communities, uh, that innovation need to be cognizant of the fundamental reasons why that is required and why the gap exists. When, when we innovate for bottom of the pyramid or underserved or, or marginalized, we tend to focus too much on reducing the cost because affordability is the key criteria and that drives us in in the direction of something that very proudly you know proudly a lot of people in our country call frugal innovation or jugad and that is that is the crux of the problem we assume that poor uh, will live with poor education or poor health care or poor cook stoves as you highlighted aspirations are not monopoly of rich and it's extremely important that if you are an innovator in social sector, you recognize that aspiration of, of, of people who could, who could not pay you for the luxury. 
and 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 and, and therefore the business models that will work for social innovators would probably be different because in in social innovation space if you become an entrepreneur you are actually not competing with an oracle or google or general motors you are competing with poverty and and th that is where you have to create competitive advantage so how do you how do you take to market your innovation is always a challenge and a lot of times uh, we uh, in in philanthropy as well as in academia get into an endless debate of for profit and not for profit i think social innovators need to completely ignore the whole uh, you know dichotomy of for profit and not for profit because it doesn't matter at all what matters is a sustainable enterprise how do you build that sustainability could be paying capability of your consumer or paying capability of a stakeholder who wants that consumer to get access to your product or services uh, or, or just the uh, the emergency of the social structure that would require your uh, enterprise to be sustainable and and that is where professor ravi you highlighted the value of that and and it's not one or two you know every stage of product development you you face those valleys of death and those valleys of death exist because of not only lack of capital but lack of infrastructure the current innovation to market or lab to market infrastructure is geared towards the commercial world for example we all use uh, lang in our language royalty licensing commercialization these the, all these concepts come from traditional industrial commercial world we believe that if i do a research in in an institute like iit publish the paper present in a conference there would be some pharma company or some chemical company that would come and license it and then take it to market unfortunately this whole model of this dichotomy of one set of people inventing or innovating another set of people then licensing that innovation to take it to market doesn't exist in social world because the market has to be created and it is extremely important that the innovators who decide to play in this space have the courage and inclination to become entrepreneurs themselves your your innovation has to go to the communities for which it was meant to be you have to do it yourself or find people who are your co-founders and take it to market otherwise it will remain in the in the journal and and the conferences it won't go to the communities and therefore we uh, in the social sector uh, which includes philanthropy government and and high net worth individuals who are philanthropically inclined and corporate csr responsibilities we need a new category of capital in the world today especially in india the existing sources of capital have challenges the first challenge is they are not patient enough uh, maybe you will find angel investors or or vcs who are willing to invest in you for 2 years or 3 years or maybe 5 years or 6 years uh, but it's extremely difficult to find investors who will remain invested for say 10 to 15 years so so the extremely high Uh, level of patience that is required so as a as a provider of capital are you willing to remain invested for a longer duration question number 1 question number 2 it's not just the duration or the patience it's also the risk appetite uh, the services business or you know a lot of businesses which are very easily getting funded today are low risk when i say low risk it doesn't mean they are profit making they can still be loss making but the perception is they are low risk and eventually investors would get out of that there are a lot of very well funded organizations in india today uh, who either have negative gross margins or they have uh, very poorly defined revenue models but they have been funded you know in billions of dollars by vcs and private equity that that doesn't make them non profit right they're not making profit doesn't make them non profit similarly a not for profit which is financially sustainable doesn't make 
a non-profit for profit, right? So financial sustainability is equally important for a non-profit as well. So whether as an entrepreneur you build your business on a non-profit or a for-profit legal structure, you still have to create revenue models where someone is willing to pay for your product and services. The third attribute of capital, one I talked about patience and second risk, is suboptimality of risk return trade-off. So in conventional investing world, you trade off risk or patience or return. So if it's very long-term investment, you expect higher return. If it is very risky investment, you expect higher return. And all investors, whether individually, for example, if we invest our personal money in bank deposit versus stock market versus real estate, we do it in our minds all the time, right? Am I taking a one-year risk or a 10-year risk? And accordingly, we expect a return. Similarly, the investors, uh, in, in, in the capital markets have a, have a return expectation based on the risk they take. So its risk is the duration or the patience and uh, based on the, the, the risk return expectation, they have a, risk, a return expectation. In social sector, this model doesn't work because you may actually take a very long term view on the investment. You are also taking a very high risk because no one has done it, so you are taking a much higher probability of default here. And still you may have to live with a 3% IRR rather than 20% IRR over a 10 year horizon, if at all you ever get an exit. So suboptimality of risk return is always there despite taking much higher risk than commercial investor and remaining invested for a much longer period. And that category of capital doesn't exist. We have government capital which gets spread very thinly over a lot of institutions. And we have philanthropic capital and very few philanthropists actually do what, you know, some rare breed of philanthropists have done in the country. But that is not enough. We need a much larger pool of capital if we have to take these solutions to market. The second important and related point here is in the VC world or in a private investment world, the resource allocation is not a challenge. So if there are 20 e-commerce companies, I can invest in 20, maybe one will make me money, I don't mind losing on 19. The whole venture investing model is based on invest, making a large number of investment and getting a disproportionately high return in one. This kind of a resource allocation will never work in social sector. So you cannot afford to have multiple social sector research projects simultaneously and spreading a very small amount of capital that you have got from government or private sector or Tata Trust or any other organization and then thinly distributing very democratically over 20 research projects because that is again suboptimal. So how do you find a very efficient resource allocation model where the opportunity cost of the money that you, you are accessing is very high? Opportunity cost of the money that a Flipkart or an Ola can access is not as high as the opportunity cost of the money that you access for your cook store or gasifier, right? So how do you ensure that you utilize that source of fund optimally for the highest social impact project, reducing the overhead significantly, and ensuring that only those projects in your organization or institution get funded that maximize the social impact and create financial sustainability? I think that is the challenge that exists for government, for philanthropists like Tata Trust, for educational institutions like IITs, IISCs, and for researchers like Professor Joshi and entrepreneurs like Professor Joshi. So this is the challenge, you know, aggregating that philanthropic pool of resources, increasing the size of that, attracting uh, high net worth and individual investors into that, convincing them to accept the asymmetry in risk return, and allocate that to projects in an extremely efficient and effective way. That is when we, 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 we start seeing uh, some, some level of uh, success in terms of resource allocation. So that was the theme that I wanted to highlight because I'm not from uh, research, uh, have been from investing, but this is an entirely new thing that I have learned in my association with Tata Trust that all the models that we learned in private sector, in venture investing, they cannot be 
copy pasted in the social sector. We need to create new models of innovation and investment funding, and, and, and that should be one of the uh, focus areas for people who are on the intersection of entrepreneurship and science. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manoj, for your insights. Uh, we will have time to discuss them a little later. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. A. Gurunathan. Uh, he's a graduate in agricultural engineering from the TNAU in uh, Coimbatore. He also has a master's in rural management from the Institute of Rural Management in Anand. Uh, he has been the director of the Tata Dhan Academy since April 2015. Uh, his experience uh, spans uh, irrigation water management, tank irrigation systems in projects uh, sponsored by the IFPRI, Washington and the Ford Foundation. He has been instrumental in a number of national initiatives, uh, such as setting up an automatic dairy plant with uh, Amul in Anand. Uh, as the chief executive of the Dhan Foundation's water uh, team, uh, which is Dhan Mailagam uh, Foundation. He leads a team of professionals currently in para-professionals. He has participated in a number of roundtable conferences across the globe um, and has served as the advisory in the advisory committee of the National Water Academy, Pune, and the National Hydrological Institute for Hard Rock uh, Areas in Belgaum. Uh, he's also in the Central Planning Commission for the Government of India on Water Governance and has been critically uh, involved in drafting the 12th five-year plan. Uh, Mr. Gurnadhan, please. Thank you, Dr. Murli. And uh, at the outset, I thank uh, Tata Center for Technology and Design for inviting me and giving me th this opportunity. In fact, this came uh, because few of the Tata fellows and professors visited our organization, Dhan Foundation. The uh, Dawn Foundation is a professional uh, development and non-governmental organization uh, working in 14 states on various thematical verticals with 1.5 million poor families. Uh, and uh, the Tata Dan Academy is one of the initiatives of the Dawn Foundation with the support of Ratan Tata Trust again in 2000, mainly to uh, produce uh, postgraduate in development management to work in the development sector as a development professionals. So I have been working with Dan for the past uh, 20 years. Uh, it is my 20th year. Mainly in the water sector, all other speakers have uh, talked about the innovations, the scope of innovation. But as a uh, practitioner in the field for the issues and challenges faced by the community, we try to partner with various agencies and take that innovation, innovative products or services to the hands of the community and make them to practice sustainability. In that uh, few of some of the uh, interventions I want to highlight uh, for the August audience. First is uh, the drinking water. If you take a drinking water, we talk about safe drinking water. But the people living in the very rural area where they have to depend on when there is no piped water supply or a combined drinking water supply program, and when they have to depend on uh, whatever the drinking water sources from the open sources, they have to depend on how to ensure uh, safe drinking water. That is where we, we brought uh, technology called uh, bio sand filter. It's a bio sand filter is at a household level because many times the challenge is. Uh, even though at the source you provide uh, water uh, very safe and clean, but at the use, when the community, when they use it, use some water which is little not uh, uh, safe, washing utensils and use that utensils for fetching the water again contaminate the safe drinking water which they have fetched from the source. So how do you make them to have uh, uh, this bio sand filter? Is a vertical slow sand filter? It removes uh, pathogens or the E. coliforms. It removes iron. It removes uh, various uh, impurities in the water and thereby proving, providing. So the removal efficiency is 99.9%. That is what uh, this. But uh, the practice of using it, how do you bring it? That is where we do uh, some sort of a behavioral change communication. We, we always, people believe all piped water supply is safe, but uh, when you take them to with the moringa seed, 
make them to apply this crime grounded moringa seed powder into the water and keep it overnight the color change says the contamination then they get that so far they are drinking the water which is not safe then they start uh, resorted using to it and for this making us a model we train the mason on fabricating this biosand filter and we also train uh, the women at the household level how to pack the filter material sand gravel stone and pebbles and how do you take it out and uh, wash it and repack it again so that it can it can be a sustainable use model which they can use it so only the drawback is here it is sturdy because it is of uh, concrete uh, structure we also tried in fabricating uh, this thing using stainless steel foot grade material and uh, plus this uh, uh, frb all these materials but uh, it is cost is one of the important this thing another thing is uh, the uh, uh, the people want a less cost product so that they can invest we don't give any such intervention as a free free of cost uh, we also try to tap some of the grant from the corporates and 50% the community owns another 50% we give it as a non returnable i mean returnable grant without interest so that it, this can be used for many people and can have a uh, impact uh, uh, with a single grant it, it, it will have a multiplier effect another drinking water in a coastal area is uh, where the lot of dugout pond is called uh, uranis these uranis uh, in a clay black cotton soil area has a issue of turbidity and uh, uh, again uh, when you want to the community want to use this turbid water they have a traditional method of cleaning but we try to intervene by scientifically by introducing horizontal filter and also a draw well and also subsequently with a mark 3 hand pump and then it goes to the vertical slow sand filter and so that they can get a, a safe drinking water at the urani level but still because of the plow cotton soil with uh, the colloid status of more than 100 ntu it tried to choke the filter uh, beds and uh, the filtration doesn't happen this is one of the challenges we face at a community water infrastructure level and because uh, this is uh, one of the solution which uh, is used for fluoride high uh, locations even the bihar government adopted this innovative model invited us under their swast program uh, we have done it in gaya district for going for urani construction by harvesting rainwater for make use of the community so that the people need community need not depend on the groundwater which is fluoride rich so these are on the drinking water side we have worked and similarly we have worked on the tank irrigation system tank is nothing but uh, uh, an earthen embankment if you put across the slope uh, and it will store the water uh, but uh, the tank is also when it is during the storage period of three to four months of monsoon harvested monsoon water it recharges the ground water so we try to use uh, the environmental isotope tracing technology from Papa Atomic Research Center to what extents uh, renovated tanks vis-a-vis -vis tanks which are not re rehabilitated tanks uh, recharge the ground water but one of the challenges here is uh, this you know environmental isotopes we will know how to what extent nearly about one kilometer or 1.2 kilometer the recharge influence is that but how much water is recharged the quantifying is one of the technology we want to find we also work with uh, university of uh, uh, waterloo and iowa state university on how to quantify the water which is being used i mean recharged in the tank system similarly when you are in the earlier years when the rainfall is plenty and the climate change effect were very nil people used to do a open drain or a cha open channel irrigation system but now uh, being a protective irrigation system and with a varied uh, rainfall climatic pattern it is a challenge for a uh, farming community to go for a open uh, irrigation system so we try we try to introduce uh, micro irrigation or sprinkler irrigation with uh, piped system from the sluice of a tank but uh, again in a colloidal places where we are not able to get enough head in throwing the water to the required wetted perimeter so these are all some of the innovative uh, technological innovation we have taken to the farmers 
and we made them to economize the use of water and, and on the health and nutrition side and also small millet side also we are working on with various uh, innovative this thing. So all these things probably uh, during the discussion time if you have any questions. Uh, one of another uh, innovation we are trying uh, is on we tried uh, on a rainfall, uh, deficit rainfall insurance product for the people. Currently, uh, the whatever the insurance products are available are IMD station based, uh, uh, I mean rainfall index based. But uh, the rainfall variability is so high, so we have done a spacing study for an automatic rain cards and we found 5 kilometer radius is an ideal space to have a representative rainfall data and thereby you can design a product for uh, rainfall, deficit rainfall indexes using actuaries and other th insurance actuaries and all we tried for uh, the rainfall index based insurance that is also we have a lot of uh, knowledge and uh, these things are available but still having a perfect uh, rainfall index based product is a very challenging one and like this a lot of uh, things we are doing it being a professional community for making the benefit to the underprivileged bottom of the permit people and with that uh, I conclude my speech and also to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Nando. So uh, thank you all the speakers for, their, for your their initial comments. Uh, I'd like to ask you all of you to come back onto the stage, please. The topic is now thrown open for discussion and uh, uh, I would uh, solicit questions from you, comments, feedback, anything, and uh, please do direct your questions to specific speakers in the panel, uh, but I will use my prerogative as the moderator for the particular session to kickstart the question and answer session by asking the first one, and I'm very intrigued by what you said, uh, Ravi, so the first question goes to you. You said now you've uh, developed a mechanism to sniff out promising candidates from a universe of possibilities, right? Is it just gut feel or do you have a process that you use that you could share? I'm sure that many people in the audience would like to know what kind of methodology you have for identifying winners early stage. That is the name of the game, right? When you look at the innovation pipeline, that seems to be a huge challenge. So if you could just throw some light on that and then uh, I throw it open for discussion. We apply four criteria for screening a potential unmet clinical need to take it forward into the problem domain. Uh, one is we look at, uh, some are common sense, we look at a local market. We need to see whether there's a really need for that or not. And uh, I think we talked about this risk and uh, Manoj Kumar talked about uh, risk and um, uh, return kind of a thing. But return, we don't talk about return in terms of return to the company, but in terms of money saved to the society. That is one we are looking at. The, the criteria one is, is a good local need or not. Number two is we look at the innovation potential. We don't look at 10%, 20% improvement. We see if they're possible, possible to improve the efficacy or improve or that make it easy or make it more effective or reach more people by at least a factor of 10 times, 15 times if possible. So large benefit of innovation potential. We don't want to make a cheaper device, but by a better device. So it has to be patentable, for example. Number three is we look at the possibility of doability, because if it's not manufacturable using the existing facilities or existing technology, so on, we don't want to take up projects which take 10 years. Can I do something in the next two years, three years, reach to the market? Because I'm in the game of creating success stories by which I want to attract more innovators to the whole game, which is more important than doing and doing success after 10 years. The fourth and the most important thing in, in our domain, healthcare domain, is that we need clinicians to be there available. Uh, so when a top clinician from JJ Hospital or let's say Beach County Hospital, this is a great problem. I know what I'm talking about. I say, sir, two questions. One is, will you give us time every week? Either you come to us or we'll come to you and we want to have feedback. Number two, will you purchase the one if you develop it and use it in your own hospital? If these two answers are yes, then we take it up. So committed clinician is a very important part of So these four criteria we apply and we, then we filter out. Sometimes some ideas look very good, but we will not take it up if it doesn't meet one of these criteria. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi. Um, it's open for discussion. I think we have a couple of volunteers walking around with uh, mics. So can we have the first question, please? Yes, Mr. Gentleman here. Anyone can answer this. Uh, what do you think universities should do to strengthen the, the incentives or supports for commercialization and deployment of technologies designed in our research labs? So is this an open question to oh, anyone? Anyone who anyone? would like okay. to comment on specific things university administrators should start doing, policies they should introduce, etc. 
this is a this topic of what universities should do in, in some senses, how far they should go in the process of, of moving things from the lab into co the commercial world. And, and traditionally, this is not something that universities do. They, they, the, the water's edge is um, uh, much closer to your feet than the horizon uh, for, for us. Uh, but that's changing. And, and, and what I'm beginning to see is a migration from the sort of by dole mentality that began in 1984 to something more now uh, that looks like a, a partnership um, between the university and the outside firms or investors who may want to bring things forward. And, and, and I'm seeing more willingness on the part of the university to um, tolerate uh, commercial firms within the, the envelope of uh, what, what is normally considered to be the sanctity of the university. I, that sound, might, might sound a little bit obscure, but, but it's especially becoming important uh, in energy, which is an area in which I work, where the scale of investment in R&D is enormous and the payback period is long and it requires a different sort of investor to, to come in. Um, and, and so we're having to invent new institutional modes that allow investors to pull money on the outside of the university and pour it into research on the inside with the expectation of earning a return. Um, and that's, that's different. I think it's an evolution from where we've been, but it's, it's, uh, it expresses more willingness on the part of the university to engage. Thank you. Well, our context is slightly different. Uh, we're a public university, and in that sense, um, uh, the, there's this fine line we walk between trying to innovate and then try to commercialize our solutions. And um, what it implies, and if you, by the way, look at the range of products we've been talking about, these are technologies which invariably take uh, several years for uh, an R&D phase to be completed before uh, one can think of actually jumping into incubation mode and develop a business model. So that time frame is better uh, done uh, as far as I'm concerned, in a university context. There is that stability that uh, and access to infrastructure that the university provides. Uh, the flip side, of course, uh, is uh, who's making the call as to <coughs> something's mature enough to exit as a technology, and uh, what's this pipeline for pushing something out of a lab uh, very rapidly into a mode where it can move. Uh, uh, so the, the fact that universities can disclose strategically advantages if you're into an R&D mode, but conversely, when the call is made that things have to move, uh, your best being on the outside. <coughs> and uh, you need an incubator uh, slash accelerator, actually, to take things forward uh, seamlessly through this uh, process of uh, exiting as a technology. Uh, uh, and, and given that, uh, again, uh, uh, a governmental setup, the strategic advantages in terms of getting, for example, CSR funding into the system, into uh, the university system, uh, which might further subsidize the R&D that we're doing, which allows for <coughs> things to be done, which, for example, governmental expenditure would not cover. Thank you. Manoj? See, uh, the, the relationship between industry and academia is very well established and it is thriving, right? So if, say, uh, a petroleum company needs a new protocol to be developed, uh, it can approach a university and most of the companies know what they need. Uh, and between them and universities, there's a very well-developed ecosystem of research and development and commercialization, and that's how most innovations actually reach out to the market, right? Universities don't take innovation to the market, but the, the business does that. Unfortunately, that model in social innovation doesn't work or has not worked. And one of the reasons is when a company goes to a university, they actually know why they are asking them to develop a new polymer or a new material and what they intend to do and how they would use in their product or their new product development process, how that nanoparticle is important. So, so the business by virtue of efficient resource allocation and the targets they have for making money, they know where they need to spend their money and they know what is the, uh, what is the reward for being successful in identifying the right technology in the right university and associating with the right set of researchers. Here, that representative doesn't exist between community and the university. So it's, uh, the, to answer your question specifically, it is extremely important for universities who are working on social innovation to make sure that they are establishing a business case upfront even before they start spending 
public money or philanthropic money in innovation. And if you build that business case up front and do a very thorough analysis of the problem statement before you start investing money in R&D, the problem of finding someone to take the product to market and go to market will be resolved because you already know what, what is the reason for you to start building that particular protocol or solution or the product, right? So I think, and some universities do it, uh, some professors probably do it better than others, uh, some researchers do it better than others, but uh, what I'm trying to say as a university administrator, we should be cognizant of the fact that if we are d solving a larger social developmental problem uh, where there is no champion who is willing to take that to market two years down the line, that responsibility is with us and we have a very strong product life cycle management and a gating system whereby we let the failure uh, be caught very early and we don't get emotionally engaged with the research and we only build you know products and solutions which the community needs and and we do it faster and quicker and in a more efficient way i think that's the challenge for universities Thank, thanks Manoj. Uh, uh, we'll move on to some other questions Ravi. Actually, I have a question. I want to shift a bit uh, in terms of the focus. Uh, so, uh, uh, major research universities uh, actually aspire to make the name uh, by the uh, kind of uh, research which they produce. And there is a hope that uh, many of these research would also result in transformational changes in society. A uh, good example in IT domains would be through companies which have come up like, say, Google or other such companies. So uh, what role do this pure technology-based R&D uh, play in terms of how much focus should be given on that without even knowing whether it's going to reach the market or whether it's going to be transformational or not? Uh, so I, I agree that there are uh, cases where you need to identify the market and then you focus on it. But, but where is the role of this uh, so-called great research then in the entire picture? So if I were to rephrase uh, the what percentage of open-ended research should exist? Is that what you're, what you're saying? Research to the market. Yeah. 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 Uh, let me take a short answer. Sure. Yeah. Very good. Uh, I think that is happening in, in institutions, open-ended research, and with the hope that someone will take it forward. Uh, I think so. Uh, and uh, what I uh, what we discovered is that the hope that I do research and someone else will take it forward, it's not happening in India at all because uh, the current is not there. So I think um, a small percentage of research could be directed, as you said, look at the problem first. Is there a good market there and make a business model to start with? And then get on with that with the knowledge that this team which is developing the solution is a team which will actually think about taking it forward. What is harm in doing 10% of research like that? We are now doing everything like that, open-ended research. Why not do a few directed research like that? And once the impact comes up, maybe more scientists will start looking at that as a, in a meaningful way. And, and let me also say in another way, when you take up a directed problems like this, we know there's a problem to be solved. Why we are looking at so many uh, basic fundamental questions which we have to answer and we have to go deep into research anyway. So we, we are producing publications as well as patents uh, when we solve a realistic problem. And most problems are multi-domain. And multi-domain also easy to publish by, by and large for scientists. That's my take. Now I think multi-domain is exactly the right word here. I mean, I, what we're really talking about is the allocation of money between science and engineering, uh, curiosity-based versus sort of need-based or need-motivated uh, work. And um, I, I, my experience has been that that there have been many scientific innovations, curiosity-driven innovations that have found their way into uh, the market through, through products or services or even through government programs um, because individuals who might not have been initially involved in the curiosity-based science become involved from other disciplines, other labs, other groups uh, as, as the science becomes better known and, and are asking questions like, what's it good for? If those people were there at the very beginning, very likely those things wouldn't have happened. But, but as things, uh, as, as mixing occurs, you, you, you frequently find that kind of thing happening. It, we, I, as far as I know, that there, there, there are no mechanisms at MIT that, that force that kind of thing to happen. Uh, but, but it's interesting to think about perhaps formalizing it in some way. Yes. 
Yeah. Hi, uh, Raju from TCS. So my question is about combining um, social along with uh, mainstream business. And this uh, combination means uh, that you know, there is this whole concept of shared value and the win-win situation which was being uh, spoken about. The concept of how can a product be created which has a social value along with the business and the profit motive. Uh, and you know, is there a change in thinking required for this? Um, and is there, what kind of interventions may be required in order to make uh, this as a mainstream thinking? Uh, I mean, anyway, businesses are meant for making profit, but you know, the, adding this whole element of, this, of social in order to ensure that a more sustainable product is picked up by a customer versus uh, an, one which is not ha does not have that value. Uh, you know, how, how does that change? And maybe some of these may come from universities, and that's where I was coming. Sort of a hybrid model where you have social. Yeah, no, it's touched on this. Yes. Uh, briefly. I mean, his, his remarks and to some extent, Professor uh, Ravi did as well with, with the idea of cross subsidizing uh, unprofitable products with profitable products. I'm suspicious of that sort of thinking, to tell you the truth, because I don't know how you do that right. Your profitable product is, is profitable because people are willing to pay a lot for that product, it's a good product. Uh, and that means that other players will be attracted to the same market, you compete with them, and you don't have the option to take your excess profit from that and, and apply it to something else. Normally people take that excess profit and apply it to further R&D to keep on the, the cutting competitive edge of, of their existing market. Um, but, I, but I began to wonder, as Manoj was talking about, what, what is the role of philanthropy in this situation? And perhaps the role of philanthropy is to make up for that compressed gross margin by subsidizing R&D, and maybe that, in a sense, is what we're all doing here at the Tata Center, benefiting from the, the insight that Ratan Tata has had in doing just exactly that, de-risking technology development in the universities in order to enable real for-profit businesses to emerge. Yeah, Rob, just to, just to add to that, see, uh, business and social are not antithesis of each other, right? Business, by definition, creates economic and social value, right? Whether it's creation of jobs or, or, or overall economic growth. The thing is, not all businesses will deliver the same level of return, right? Some businesses, by definition, would be more profitable than other, other and they will attract different types of investors, right? If, if there are five business models which are not attracting capital because of some reason, this is, this is market failure, right? So as the philanthropy, what do we do? As a philanthropy, you do three things. You handle government failure, you handle citizen failure, and you handle market failure, right? So somewhere, people are spitting on the street, right? And you are trying to run a campaign that is not the right thing to do. You are actually solving the citizen failure. If somewhere, uh, uh, access to education is not available to a government school, and you are creating teach kids for government school teachers and making sure those schools run, we are trying to address government failure because public finance should be running the government schools and hospitals and not philanthropy, right? We all get access. The third is market failure, where investors and the market are not interested in low yielding, high risk, long gestation period projects, right? So should Target Trust be doing that or the Spande Foundation be doing that or any other foundation? Yes. as long. Our role is to de-risk these business models till we find market coming up and taking over. The success criteria for a Tata Trust should be, it should stop in spending on R&D. The market should stop, right? So if the philanthropic capital can be only invested in pure philanthropy, running maybe orphanages or, you know, those kind, or, or feeding malnutrition kids in some area, you know, those are the more, you know, challenging, and that's where the whole uh, uh, opportunity cost issue. So today, if, if philanthropy has to fund research, it's because market has failed to fund that research. Market is willing to fund loss making research. I'm not saying market always funds profit making research. If you look at the 100, top 100 startups that have been funded in the last five years by market in the country, and look at their financial numbers, you'll be surprised to see how many of those are actually profitable, right? But market doesn't look at that indicator. Right? Market looks at other things. 
So the day market thinks that it's 4% IRR business that builds affordable healthcare devices for resource constrained areas and government hospital is worth investing in, right? You don't need a philanthropy uh, supporting that. Thank you. I'm just tempted to jump in because we actually were faced with uh, this kind of a problem with Tata Swatch. Tata Swatch was originally intended for the rural market, but uh, we launched it in urban uh, markets, and the same product was supposed to go with different price points in the, in the two sectors. <coughs> it is possible. We never got around to doing it, but that was a thought. And I think companies do evaluate these kind of possibilities. So um, let, me, let me remind you, we can take a few more questions, but... Uh, Hello. Yeah. Uh, Who's got the mic? Yeah, there you go. This is Shazin. This question is for Mr. Manoj Kumar. My question is what at the Tata Trust, what is your criteria or strategy when you decide this is what we want to invest in and how do you evaluate whether the impact has been successful or not? So Tata Trust being a, a, a philanthropic organization uh, basically is focused on institution building and philanthropy. We created uh, within Tata Trust a new organization about two years back. It's called FISE, Foundation for Innovation and Social Entrepreneurship, which is something similar to SIGN, but a virtual incubator. Works in partnership with large number of incubators. And we are also setting up some impact to mark, you know, market impact labs, like uh, in areas like energy, healthcare, and others. Right? So when we select these innovators and startups for incubation and seed capital, and support them. Uh, our, our evaluation model is based on impact, what problem we are trying to solve. That's the most important. We don't even look at business plans and finances before it is established that this is actually a problem that needs to be resolved and very few people are working on this. The second thing we check is can, can, can you establish the product market? Are you really building something that, that can be uh, taken to a minimum viable product that the community would need, right? So we we'll iteratively, over a period of time, work with the innovators and see whether that product can be actually taken to market. And third, uh, we look at the financial sustainability, right? So how much time will it take for this particular innovation to become financially sustainable? Based on that, we decide and determine whether this idea should go a for-profit route or a not-for-profit route, and we incubate both. We have uh, incubators in our portfolio which are not for profit because there are certain challenges. Uh, and last and most important, we look at skin in the game. Right? As an entrepreneur, as an innovator, are you willing to, uh, are you passionate about creating that impact? Right? And are you willing to run reasonably long duration with that idea? And then we support. We support like uh, we, some, we have some startups where we have not only supported them financially, raised next round of capital for them, helping them develop the market. Uh, some of our startups have broken even and be, become profitable now because we then put all our strength and leverage behind them. But Thank impact you. is first. It's impact first. Thanks, Manoj. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is more of a comment than a question, and anyone in the panel can answer it. So. Uh, so uh, we've been talking about bottom of pyramid um, since we've begun. But then I would just like to point out that, you know, you cannot look at this as some kind of a homogeneous unit. There are various strata in the bottom of pyramid that you need to consider while innovating, whether it's socioeconomic or geographical. Something, and is this is especially uh, something to note in a country like India. Uh, so if you, are, you cannot talk about localizing solutions and scaling them up in the same breadth. So when you're innovating, this is something that you need to take, you need to be cognizant of. If I may give an example of the smokeless chulas, uh, uh, um, is something that uh, works in rural Maharashtra, say I don't know how, uh, whether it will work, um, say in the rural flood plains of Bihar where I work, uh, because in the winters it gets really cold, so the traditional uh, mud chulas keep people warm. So that's like four, four months of the year, you're dependent on these. So people shift from your LPG cylinders to uh, Chula. And one last thing is that I haven't heard anyone mention gender. And I cannot state this enough, any technology that is made especially for rural communities has to be women friendly. I mean, science may be gender blind, but in this case, you need to have 20-20 vision. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, 
the panelists will, are going to be around, so please do catch them over tea and lunch and uh, dinner perhaps. So we'll move on to the next question and then we will close this session. Uh, so I'm working on a problem that every single person here is suffering from is noise pollution. And uh, my idea is to incentivize good behavior. So what we'll be doing is uh, measuring the number of honks the person is honking every single day. And the person honking lesser and lesser by the day, we'll be giving them incentives. Uh, I, I want uh, any of you to explain uh, me if they see a business problem in that. And if there is no business problem, if they would be willing to connect me with CSR, dep uh, C uh, CSR departments of uh, companies that would be willing to fund this. And my last question is, how do I make it self-sustainable where I don't have to go to CSR departments of companies and earn enough profit that I can make this self-sustainable? Thank you. So you can definitely engage with the panel. Last question. This is positively the last one. So thank you very much, sir. <laughs> and uh, I come from Nagpur. And uh, my business is to help poor people. And as you illustrate here, uh, on the auto line of pyramid. And this had been innovated and increased uh, and also helped many of the organization to help them to really look into the bottom of pyramid. Who are they? Thank you. Now, sir, you were talking about Tata Trust. Finding out such NGOs who are established for non-profit organizations like and uh, not earning or just helping the poor to come up. Now, I would like to, several times I, I, I have uh, uh, approached, approached uh, some of our friends who are working with Tata Trust. Now, my question is, you have a very interesting um, uh, 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 subject, innovate to transform. How can we transform poor people? Now, sir, I would like to really request a very small question. In what way or what are the some of the things which really Tata Public Trust or any other public trust in our country or let us say any corporates under the system of CSR would like to really find out, go to the uh, organizations who are really helping poor and try to find out their needs how to bring them up to help and reach out more, more poor people in our country. It is very easy to talk about that we are a lot of poor people, but it is also we have to have great heart to reach out those poor people to bring them sure, financially thank up. Thank you very much, thank sir. Very much. I will appreciate very much if you want to. If you, uh, sure. uh, I, I, I suggest I, that we take this during the tea break because I guess this is, uh, requires a lot of uh, input. So, let me, let me close this session in the interest of time. We uh, are running a bit late. So please join me in thanking all the speakers for uh, their wonderful insights.